And good morning, welcome back. Uh, just got off, just got home from my night shift. Doing a couple of overtimes this week. Like I've said, got some got some goals that I'm working on. So I'm doing a lot of extra work. I'm here getting ready for the market to open. I gotta do a little work. And I can't I had a little free time last night. Most of the unit is most of the patients are diagnosed as COVID. And so I had a little bit of free time and on occasion, uh, you know, you have been hearing a lot about uh, the strain, you know, the new strain coming out of Africa, uh, the new strain coming out of the UK. And of course it is projected to be here uh, in the United States, but a lot of the information, <clears throat> there's often a lot of information, of course, that doesn't get discussed. And one of them is of course, Africa, even though we hear of you know, new strain of the virus coming out of Africa, potentially more infectious. And then, of course, people are starting to hint about could it be even more severe? You know, you kind of get all of this uh, fear mongering and propaganda. But then when you actually when you actually read many of the articles that have come out of Africa, I did a video on this, I think, back in November on Africa, that Africa, for the most part, is untouched when it comes to the virus. And in fact, looking at the article, this article is dated of December 20, uh, December 30th uh, last year, basically at the end, at the end of the year uh, in December. And it says, even though that Africa was projected to have 300,000 deaths back in 2020, you can see that Africa only has 63,000 deaths, 63,000 deaths with a population of 1.2 billion, 1.2 billion people that live that live there and of course they've had a total of 2.6 million cases according to them it says the africa centers for disease control and prevention was reporting roughly 2.6 million cases with only 63,000 deaths and of course they you know they've gone in the most of the articles talk about how you know obviously africa doesn't have a very extensive uh medical system you know the hospital the hospital system is not that great uh, obviously, they're not as resource rich um, as many other countries like in the UK, uh, in the EU, and of course, here in America. But one of the easiest ways, of course, that they can uh, see how many people have died, because maybe they're not doing really good job testing. And of course, I've gone into the whole testing scenario where obviously there's many uh, false tests. And so kind of what you can look out of, obviously, if you're not if you're not picking up all of the cases, right, if you're not picking up all of these people who test positive at the very least. Well, at the very least, what you can do is, is you can basically base things off of deaths because you would look for a spike in deaths to basically give you a, a, a fair estimation of people who are passing away. What were they passing away from, uh, you know, respiratory related symptoms as that's what's most that's what most. Uh, people who die from the virus, they typically at, at some point um, require ventilation. And typically most people who, who end up on a ventilator die. I think most of the patients that have passed through the ICU end up passing away. And again, most of these patients, because typically they end up in a medical in a medical ICU. And most of these patients overwhelmingly are geriatric patients with a laundry list of medical of medical issues. Most of the patients that I've taken care of that were typically on the younger uh, end of the spectrum, like maybe like, let's just say like between 30 and 50. Overwhelmingly, most of those patients were morbidly obese. And I'm talking, you know, 250 to 300 pounds, diabetics, hypertension, typically um, still mobile. But at that rate, most of these individuals typically have some form of heart disease, um, like I said, diabetes, usually non-compliant, obviously, because they're because of their weight. And those are the, those are overwhelmingly the, on the younger end of the spectrum that I've taken care of. And of course, most of the demographics are black Hispanics. Uh, and so that's basically been my experience over the past year. Either the patients are geriatric patients who have very poor quality of life to begin with, or they're typically on the younger end, but they still have poor quality of life because uh, they don't take care of themselves. They're typically non-compliant diabetics, typically uh, non-compliant with diet, high, high blood pressure, hyperten uh, hypertension, hyper, uh, hyperlipidemia is typically um, 
the type of patients, even non-compliant with oxygen. You ask them to keep their oxygen on because they're desatting. And many of these individuals refuse to listen and sometimes they'll lose their life as a result. And that's just basically been my experience here uh, in the city of New York. The reason that I wanted to touch on this, of course, both of these articles, there's two different articles, one from October, one from this one, like I said, is from December, and I'll link both of them into the description. And they both typically go over some of the reasons why Africa, of course, is basically almost immune uh, to basically what's going on. One, obviously, the virus is not politicized over there like it is here in the States and, of course, in the UK. And for the most part, you know, they have a younger population. They don't have as many comorbidities. Uh, they did lock down a little bit earlier. Even though most individuals live fairly close together, you typically have, I forget what it is, you know, where you've got like your, your mother, father, grandmother, typically all living in close proximity, which would which is where a respiratory disease would thrive because you're living in close proximity to, to multiple individuals and it would basically pass. But since overwhelmingly they have a much younger population, and of course, even here in America, when you've looked at the data, uh, overwhelmingly, the people who have died both here and all over the EU have been typically patients who are like 79 to 86, right? And the life expectancy here in, in the, you know, in the United States is roughly around 77, 75 to 77 for men and women, and very similarly in the EU. So most of these patients are typically at the end of their life anyway. They would typically be impacted by things like the flu. The reason that I bring this up is because um, one of the biggest problems, of course, is the impact on peoples, especially young people, kids being pulled out of school, million, you know, millions of people losing their jobs because many of these businesses get shut down, etc. But often what doesn't get talked about are faulty PCR swabs. We're hearing a little bit of it now to see in my, my recent video. I talked about where the CDC finally, after a year, acknowledged faulty PCR swabs. And of course, this has been the case from the very beginning, uh, where uh, they've, they've, they've been faulty. This, this article comes out of uh, January 21st. This is released by Yahoo. And of course, this is in the UK, talking that um, this is basically a country club. And it said 18 of the 19 results in the last round of testing uh, due to an operator error, it says, of course, were ended up being false positives. So you have 18 out of 19 people that were tested that tested false positive. Of course, this gives a false view of what's really going on. You're, you, you might be thinking, Whew, this thing is just spreading like wildfire and I need to make sure I wear my mask. But then stuff like this, of course, never gets spoken to the mainstream media that maybe you need to be tested again to ensure that you really did test positive. And then of course, even another another article here, and this is coming out of From the Hill, posted on MSN, and it said, UK lab error results in more than 1,000 false positive tests. It says a testing error at England's government-funded NHS test trace facility resulted in over 13 people given false, uh, false positives, right? And again, very similar, this is not just something that is limited to uh, the UK or limited to the US. It says Sweden finds thousands of false positive tests from Chinese made uh, test kits. And this is back in October. And you can just, you know, Google or DuckDuckGo, whatever you, whatever search engine that you utilize, and just pick your country. Just pick the country of choice and just type in, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> You can just basically pick your country of choice and just uh, type into the search engine false positives. And there will be article after article after article after article uh, talking about this. Like you can see here, uh, UK purchased millions of unreliable tests, right? There was another article here, uh, Trump mocks uh, Governor Larry Hogan who bought millions this is back in November. And I believe he spent like 9 million. I think it was 9 million in, uh, yeah, it was 9 million on faulty tests. And most of these tests are around $20 a peak, $20 a pop. And so this is a, a widespread problem, especially because you're basing, you know, whether you're locking people down and locking people in their homes, like they're doing in China, like they're doing in the UK. And it says, uh, again, UK, 
uh, says millions of tests of kit of test kits that were bought. And this is as of Newsweek. This is Newsweek. Uh, and this is actually at the beginning, right? This is 420. So this is more towards the beginning. Again, like I've said, this has been a problem throughout this entire and throughout this entire year and going from 2020 into now. It says UK it says millions of test kits bought from China are unreliable for most patients. And of course, when you're utilizing a faulty test as a as a way to decide whether you're gonna lock people down, decide whether your business is closed or whether the, the business where you work at gets shut down is foolish, especially because like I showed in my last video where you had Dr. Fauci openly state that in no way, shape or form is are individuals who are asymptomatic able to spread a respiratory disease and he said throughout all history right so he's he's been around right he's been around since the reagan era right so we're talking like 40 years of practicing as a medical practitioner in the area of communicable communicable diseases this is what he specializes in and so i'll leave the link for that video and in that in that video i showed that he himself said that in his entire career and in all history he said in all history in terms of respiratory diseases that they there has never been a virus that has been able to spread asymptomatically to the degree that these individuals that of course are making this exclamation and of course in my opinion overwhelmingly it's because they're mass testing individuals and you're testing people with faulty test kits and so these people who have absolutely no symptoms because they're worried because they're they're hearing that this virus is of course very deadly uh, and for many individuals who are typically on the geriatric spectrum it is it can be very deadly for many of these individuals but so would the flu so would most respiratory diseases because most of these elderly patients by the time they reach their 70s are typically revolving are a revolving door for the hospital they typically come in every month or every month and a half they're overwhelmingly you know a uh, week when it comes to even things like seasonal flu and so of course a novel virus is going to heavily impact many of the geriatric patients but overwhelmingly we i don't see uh young people like i said most of the young people who are like 30 to 50 are typically morbidly obese typically 250 pounds 300 pounds individuals who who have neglected their health uh, basically all of their all of their life to reach to reach that level of disease at that at their age i've seen some people when i'm like reading and reading their history and i'm like how old is this person and it's like 35 you know and they've got like poly substance abuse you know cocaine abuse which impacts their heart they're non-compliant with their diet with their diabetes regime so you know they've got finger sticks of over 400 which of course also impacts the heart they're obese and these are the individuals that come to the hospital and the other thing that i wanted to touch on is as a result of this of course policies are being made and you have dangerous uh, policies or dangerous individuals who who have positions of authority and so as a result of uh, what they imagine to be a widespread disease that is basically ravaging a country and as a result they've impoverished millions across the globe it's like I think the numbers were between 200 million and 500 million people across the globe have fallen below the poverty line. And I find it disgusting to think that you've basically impoverished all these people. And now you want them to take an untested vaccine so that they can feed their families, right? Whereas Ohio Republican lawmaker wants stimulus checks tied to the vaccine. And, it, and it's like, have you missed a meal? You know, have you missed a paycheck? Most of these individuals haven't. But as a result of the policies that are put in place by lawmakers, many of these individuals have fallen into poverty. They've lost their jobs and they're hoping that the government will come through for them. But the sad part is, is for individuals to be this heartless. But these are the times that we live in. And many of these individuals, like I've always said and has been said in the past, is that the people who you put in charge are only a reflection of you and so like here in america we've seen a lot of moral decay and as a result people who are morally inept come into positions of authority and these individuals that you basically hire that are paid for through your taxes subsequently then become kings over you 
and you have no way of being able to defend yourselves from this sort of mentality it becomes very difficult especially when you're impoverished especially when you're seeing millions of people who are losing their jobs then you feel almost compelled to make a decision that you may you may not make otherwise especially when you have not all of the facts as a nurse or as any sort of clinician it is our responsibility to educate to educate people so that they can make what is called an informed decision and so if individuals are not basically coming forward this with this information many patients may make a decision that they may otherwise not as a result of not having this sort of information and as a healthcare practitioner i've been practicing uh, as a nurse i've worked in multiple avenues from critical care to acute care oncology i've done uh, you know working in a nursing home to working in hospice and i worked in a wide range of areas and i've always prided myself on making sure to do my very best educate my patients so that they can be able to make an informed decision and unfortunately we're not seeing that sort of information being given to us either through the mainstream media or even in the hospital setting we get the same regurgitated information um, that is given that you hear on the mainstream media we get the same pamphlets and they just regurgitate the same information but we don't hear we don't hear about information like this we don't hear about the the, the thousands the millions of false tests, the inaccuracy. We don't we don't hear about this. Most people I show them this and they're shocked. I think there was another article that I read where the um there was a there was an article that I read uh on the, in the UK where the UK rapid test is almost 50% inaccurate. And I wish I was looking for it when I came home and I, I didn't get a chance to post it onto my onto my YouTube. There was an article that I came across lot just before it was like just before I left. It was like six o'clock in the morning and I was reading this article where uh, it said that up to up to it was like three percent accurate it was like three percent uh accuracy with 50 almost 50 percent was 49 percent or 53 percent I forget um that was, they were inaccurate they were all all false positives and I've shown even you know in other articles even here um for example if we were to look up like right NFL NFL Right, NFL false positives, and it exists here, right? It exists here. CBC 77, 77 NFL players that tested false positive as, as a result of uh, a lab error in New Jersey. But this, this is information, of course, that we don't hear. It's very unfortunate. And so unfortunately, you have to rely upon either secondary sources like via people who, who do videos on YouTube or a lot of this information many individuals uh, unfortunately don't hear. And as a result of that, they're misinformed. And as a result of that, they have an unnecessary fear of something that that potentially could be not as dangerous as as it's led as people are basically led to believe. When you start doing reading and you start paying attention to what you see uh, going on, where it, it's okay for this group of people to have rallies, but it's not okay for this group of people to have rallies, and it's okay for for this to take place because well, at least they had masks on, so it's okay. Um, but if this other group does it, then it's completely out of control and don't forget about the virus, et cetera. But this is, this is unfortunately the age that we're living in. We have a lack of leadership, uh, not just within politics, but even within the medical professionals, because this just basically everything is compromised. And unfortunately it's the people who end up suffering as a result.